We made it! We are on the last hacking unit of AP Biology, isn't that crazy? It is finally time for the long-awaited Unit 8 Ecology. It's gonna be epic! Come on, it's the last unit. It can't not be epic. Hello everybody, I'm Karara, and today we're just gonna be going through all the stuff you gotta know for the last unit of AP Biology, and finally we are done with our series. A bunch of you guys kept asking me to make this last one, and finally I'm getting to it, okay? I'm sorry I couldn't make it earlier, but we are here. We are here. Alright, so to begin our epic adventure into the land of ecology, you first gotta understand the way the world is organized, right? In a biological perspective, of course, who cares about the political organization of the world? That is just lame. So basically all our other units have been at the organismal level, right? Oh my god, that's a mouthful, right? Basically an organism is a single dude, like I'm an organism, you're an organism, my camera is sadly not an organism, but you are, don't worry. Now when you have a big group of a single species, that is called a population. So for example, if you have a forest and there's a bunch of rabbits living in that forest and happily jumping around, they are a population of rabbits. There are a different population from a rabbit in like a different different forest somewhere else. And then we have communities which are basically just a bunch of populations mashed together. So if we had our population of rabbits and we combine it with a population of I don't know what else lives in forests. Do, do rabbits even live in forests? I don't even know. But let's just say we combine it with like a population of quail or turkey or something. Then all the populations in that forest come together to form a community, right? So basically that's when like different animals, different plants, all the all the organisms in that like forest are interacting with each other, that's a community. Now the way I like to remember the difference is like when, when you talk about your school, right? You're basically saying like all the students at your school is the population, right? But then when you say you're doing work in your community, that could talk about your school, that could talk about like your library, that could talk about anything in that city, right? Not just people who go to us that, that are part of a certain group. So communities are just a bunch of organisms interacting with each other, right? Then we add in all the like non-living stuff that they interact with, right? And we get an ecosystem. Like for example, soil is not part of the community, right? Because the community is only living stuff. But then when you go to the ecosystem level, you're basically including all the soil as well. And of course, the organisms interact with the non-living stuff, right? They're called abiotic factors, they're not very relevant. But basically the trees like grow and how well they grow depends on the soil they grow in. And then finally, all the ecosystems of planet Earth come together to make your biosphere. Oh my god, <laughs> it's the sphere, so it's probably the Earth. Very nice. Alright, so nice, that's all you gotta know about organization. Let us move on, and we're gonna go through each of these one by one. It'll be epic. So we've already talked a lot about organisms, right? Like, we don't wanna keep, like, slapping a dead horse. Alright, I don't know how the saying goes, but we're gonna talk more about animal behavior now, right? So we've talked about a lot about, like, animal physiology, how they work, and that kind of stuff. Now we're gonna talk about their behavior, right? What they do. For example, me talking to a camera is a very awkward, weird behavior, but I'd still do it. That's, that's a behavior, okay? It has nothing to do with, like, how my heart pumps blood throughout my body, okay? It's something I choose to do. And basically, behaviors are done in response to your environment, right? You don't just, like, always talk to a camera. That would be extremely weird. Well, that's kind of a bad example, but, but like, a better example is, like, when you burn yourself, you draw your hand back, right? So the stimulus, the thing that causes it, is this, like, hot stove that you're touching. Stove, stove. I don't even know. Yeah, stove, okay. <laughs> and then your the and then the behavior is what results from that, right? So stimulus causes behavior. Sorry, not behavior, action. And then this whole flow chart is a behavior. Alright, so now that we have the concept of behavior, we actually have to know why, right? Like what's the relevance of behaviors? Why the heck do we care about all this nonsense about animals doing random stuff? Well basically the dude named Tinbergen, basically he's some random ornithologist, who cares where he came from? But what we do care about are the four questions that he posed about behaviors. First, what causes the behavior, right? That's just like, well, what's the stimulus, right? Alright, how does it develop? Like, for example, is it something that I just know how to do instinctively, right? Like, or is it something that I learn over time? Like, touching a stub reflex is obviously not something you learn, right? You don't, like, the first time you touch a stub, you're not like, oh, yeah, that feels so good. And then you slowly take it off, right? <laughs> no, that's like something that you know right off the bat, you just automatically do it. Because it hurts. <laughs> So those are called innate behaviors, right? Stuff that you already have. And then of course there are learned behaviors, right? Like for example, I learned how to use Photoshop. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> that's a good example. Like a baby did not know how to use Photoshop, but I am clearly a master. You can see how good my, my handwriting is. <laughs> Epic. All right, and then third, we have how does it affect fitness, right? Like there's no reason why somebody would evolve a behavior if it doesn't like make, make them like more likely to survive. I don't know why I play video games so much then, if that is the case, but but the point is, how does it affect fi fitness, okay? Well, to be fair, it's okay if it negatively affects fitness, okay? Like, for example, a behavior where, like, a chimp teaches her kids not to eat poisonous fruit, that's clearly, like, gonna increase your fitness, right? Because, like, <laughs> eating poisonous fruit is, like, the stupidest thing you could do, and that's obviously bad for your fitness. So, uh, teaching, so teaching your kids is obviously gonna increase your fitness. 
And then once we answer how it increases fitness, then we could answer how did it evolve, right? Like the chimps that teach their kids not to eat poisonous fruits are going to have more kids, and their kids are probably going to teach their kids, right? So that's how probably how that behavior evolved. All right, so these are the four questions we got to keep in mind, so let us move on. These are pretty self-explanatory. Honestly, you got, I didn't really need to explain it to you guys. You guys probably already knew this stuff, but it's, it's good to have it in your mind before we get into the fun stuff. So basically, the first question is what causes it, right? So let's just talk about environmental cues, right? A lot of animals do stuff in response to the environment. And basically, the three examples that I'm going to talk about are migration, hibernation, and estivation. And um, most of these probably are familiar to you. Estivation is like a weird one. You probably don't know that one. But migration, right? Just moving from one place to another. And this is obviously in response to like colder weather, right? Like some birds move north in order to avoid like super bad winters, right? Then hibernation, a bunch of animals like speed through the winter so they don't waste energy. And that's basically triggered by decreasing temperatures, right? And then estivation is a weird one that you never hear about. But basically they sleep through summers, right? Like if you're in a desert and it's a really dry environment and it gets really, really bad in summer, you probably want to sleep through the summer okay i'm not gonna lie i would want to sleep through all the bad stuff that happens to me but sadly it just doesn't work for some reason my mom was yelling at me and i tried to go to sleep but it didn't work she, she didn't stop so sad now you don't really have to know much about these just know that they exist like these are pretty common english words so you should probably know them before you go to the test but it's not it's not particularly complicated or anything however a more complicated one that is actually pretty important are circadian rhythms and it, it sounds really fancy okay it, it sounds like well, that's going to be super, super complicated. What does it have to do with cicadas? But no, it's literally just rhythms, right? <laughs> your daily rhythm of your body. Like basically the reason why you feel sleepy in the night is because due to these circadian rhythms that like change over the day, your body starts secreting melatonin in the night, right? Don't get it confused with melanin. That's what makes my skin so dark, okay? But basically in response to the sunlight, your body like go undergoes changes throughout the day in this 24-hour cycle. And that's just what a circadian rhythm is. 24-hour changes in your body. Like, honestly, the only thing you have to know about circadian rhythms are, is that they're rhythms and they happen every day, right? Don't, don't worry about anything other, like, complicated stuff about them. All you have to know is that they're daily cycles. Okay, so now let us talk about the second question, how is it learned? And we already talked about two of the main types where you got innate versus learned. So let's start with innate, why not? So we already talked about one, right? Reflexes, that's pretty obvious, right? Like, that's just stuff that automatically happens when you touch a burning stuff, when you step on a, like, tack, your um, foot pushes up, when you hit your, when you hit your knee, your, your thing kicks. That's why all the doctors have that epic rubber hammer. Dude, I've never actually, have they? I don't even know the last time I've done a knee jerk reflex test. But the actual reason why your feet do that, like why when a like doctor hits that ligament, it like kicks out, it's actually kind of interesting. It basically has to do with like lifting too much weight and if it feels so much strain there, it basically causes you to stand up. And then the other one that nobody knows about because like nobody like talks about this much for humans are fixed action patterns. <laughs> like, it literally, it literally says, right? Fixed action patterns. Like, when an organism sees a certain stimulus, it goes through this pattern exactly, like, every time it sees that stimulus, right? Fixed action patterns. Like, in a response to something, it always does the same thing. And the stimulus that causes it is called the key stimulus, not very relevant, but <laughs> it, it's fun to know. So, basically, a very good example of this are sticklebacks, right? Uh, this is a very good stickle... What am I... <laughs> this is a very good stickleback drawing, okay? and you got a tail, okay. So essentially every time a stickleback sees another male stickleback, right, and that's also a stickleback, I promise, and basically all these males have like a red belly, very cool. Every time it sees another male stickleback, it starts acting really aggressive, right, because basically these male sticklebacks fight each other for me. But basically what scientists found out is that like even if there are no other male sticklebacks, if you just show them something with a red belly, they'll actually start acting aggressive towards it. So you could put a perfectly harmless like square blob and epic my drawing skills make it even more blobby-ish and then you just put a red belly on it and even though it's not a fish it doesn't even look like a fish <laughs> the the male stickleback still attacks it and gets really angry and stuff and then when you put a lifelike model like you make this actually look like a fish but you take off the red belly the, the fish doesn't do anything it's crazy so basically all you have to know about fixed action patterns is that they happen in response to a very specific stimulus and no matter like what shape that stimulus happens in it always goes through the same action. And it's innate, okay? You don't have to learn it. Like, any stickleback would do this. Well, any male stickleback that, like, cares about red things, but... <laughs> but you get what I mean, okay? All right, so, what's the opposite of innate? Yeah, you guys remember. That's right. You guys were paying attention when I talked about it, right? Right? You better have been. Learned behaviors. So basically there's a bunch of types of this, but we're gonna start with habituation, okay? And honestly, not very complicated, right? Habit just means you got used to something. You just do it over and over again. And basically, habituation, all that means is that, like, something happens so often that you stop responding to it. Like if I keep clapping like this and it gets annoying after some time, you just start ignoring it, okay? You might start yelling at me, but like eventually you'll give up because I just don't stop clapping. I guess I just did. But basically your brain eventually tunes that out. 
And that's habituation. When you have a repeated stimulus, it eventually stops mattering as much. Your brain tunes it out and that's habituation. And it kind of makes sense why animals do that, right? Because if you're constantly seeing something, there's no reason why you should have to keep reprocessing it every single second. So it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. And then the next one is imprinting. Now this one's the most confusing one. Like there's like no way to <laughs> remember this because imprinting does remind me of like printing presses. Like what, what does this have to do with printing presses? They're not making any newspapers here. It turns out that imprinting, all it means is that when, like, baby chicks hatch, right? That's a chick, I promise. Oh my god, that's- what does that even- oh my god. <laughs> oh, you know, I should stop trying to draw it on these videos, god dang it. But yeah, basically it's when a chick that's all- oh my god. You know, okay, let's pretend that's a chick. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Basically, the chick, when it hatches out of its shell, it looks at the first animal it sees, right? Which is usually its mother. And it starts following around the mother and doing everything that the mother does. So that's basically imprinting, basically when a chick like latches on to an individual and starts learning from them like at an early stage in their life. And then you got your mama's nonsense thing. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it's bigger, but it looks the same. It's fine. But the reason why this is relevant, right, is because once a baby gets out of its like egg, right, it's, it's susceptible to predators. And the best way to avoid the predators is to follow your mom around, copy what your mom's doing. If you get separated from your mom, you're basically dead. But another fun fact about imprinting is that, like, it could sometimes backfire, right? Like, um, they're, they're trying to, like, rehabilitate whooping cranes, right? And if the whooping cranes see a human first, they only respond to the human. So basically, the humans dress up in crane costumes to make sure that the, like, the birds still recognize what one of their own kind looks like. It's crazy. Okay, all right, and now it is time for the fun stuff, okay? The stuff that annoys the heck out of people whenever they hear it. Conditioning. All right, I know this term from badminton because it sucks. I, I hate getting buffed. <laughs> oh, I mean, I could use a little bit of that now, god dang it. But this is the ecology kind of conditioning, okay? So not that bad. Oh, that's pretty bad. You, you, you'll see it, you'll see it. So the first type is classical conditioning. And honestly, I don't know what's so classical about it because the other type is a bit more classical than me, but <laughs> all it means is that these two are like types of associative learning, right? And classical is basically associating something with something completely unrelated, right? For example, if a dog- <gasps> Why do I try to do this to myself? Oh my god, that's an- I don't know what that is. That looks like a banana, dude. I don't know what's going on with my drawing skills. Please, please ignore that, but let's just say there's a dog and there's some food, right? And every time you give the dog the food, you also ring a bell. So obviously the dog salivates at the food, right? When you put the two together, the dog is still gonna salivate at the food. But eventually, if you do that enough times, the dog will also salivate at the bell. So even though the bell is completely unrelated, the dog learns to associate the the food with the bell and that like ultimately re results in an action that is related to the food, even though it's not related to the bell. So essentially, all three together is conditioning it, and then eventually, either of them, if you put the food only, or if you put only the bell, the dog will still have the same response. Now the other one makes a lot more sense to me, operant, right? You're operating, you're, you're doing something to like achieve a certain goal, right? operant, operational, I don't know, that, that's how I remember it, but essentially, it's positive or negative reinforcement, right? That's, that's like what I think of whenever I think of conditioning, which is why I thought it would make sense more to call this classical, but operant makes a lot of sense, right? You're really teaching an organism how to do something by giving it positive or negative reinforcement. So an example that a lot of books use is you have a rat, and basically there's a lever, and every time the mouse presses the lever, the food comes out, right? So essentially, even if the mouse originally just hit the lever by accident, it's gonna be like, oh, there's food. So maybe I should keep doing that. And every time it gets more food, the the action is more conditioned and eventually it'll be like, okay, I should I know that every time I'm gonna hit this lever is beneficial to me, so it'll keep doing that. But it can also go the other way, right? Negative reinforcement, if you hit the lever, you get electric shock and eventually the mice will, mouse will stop touching the lever. All right, now the next thing we want to talk about is communication. And honestly, there's literally not much in the book about communication and like, I don't know why there's a whole subsection of the AP curriculum dedicated to communication, but like, most of the stuff you have to know is pretty self-explanatory, right? Like basically animals could communicate with each other audibly, right? Like I'm talking to you guys visually, right? I'm also like showing you guys stuff on the screen. Or they could also communicate with chemicals, right? And unfortunately I'm not sending you guys any chemicals to your house, that would be kind of creepy. <laughs> but like, for example, dogs. Dogs is a pretty good example. Um, they basically pee on everything. If you guys have a dog, you probably know that your dog pees on everything. And that's because of something called pheromones. So basically pheromones are just chemicals that are used to communicate with other members of your species, right? So when a dog pees on a, I don't want to draw this too graphically, but let's just pretend, you know, uh, that's a tail, that's a other leg, and that is your raised leg for your dog, and then it goes like that, and, <laughs> oh, beautiful. I even got the splash marks. So essentially, every time a dog pees on something, it leaves behind a bunch of chemicals that other dogs can smell. And then there's also, like, coloration, right? Like, for example, if a bee, a bee has, like, yellow and white stripes, because that tells other animals that bees are dangerous, right? That's also why, like, 
poison dart, dart frogs all look like black and this really bright color. So that's called aposematic coloring or just warning coloring. And that's not really that relevant, but the idea is that like animals could also communicate with other species just by how they look. This is also an example of malarian mimicry, right? So basically two dangerous animals mimic each other so that people will learn to avoid them. You know, while I'm at it, I might as well tell you guys about Batesian mimicry, right? So malarian is basically like, um, warning dudes. The reason why I remember that is because Mueller sounds like such a like scary name. I don't know. It just, it just sounds like Robert Mueller, like special counsel. Seems like a buff guy who's going to beat people up. But Batesian just sounds like some random math guy. He can't beat anybody up. So Batesian are like not not strong guys pretending to be like big strong guys so that people don't attack them. Okay, very epic with that out of the way. Let us now talk about something completely unrelated but still related to organisms. We are going to talk about endotherms versus ectotherms. I had no idea how to segue into this, so we're just gonna go with it. So whenever you look at fancy bio words, you just look at the Latin roots because usually bio words, even though they suck, <laughs> I will admit that, they usually are pretty descriptive. So endo means in, right? And therms means temperature. So these basically are the guys who generate their own temperature internally, warm-blooded guys. And then ectotherm, ecto means outside, therm means temperature, so you're getting your heat from the out outdoors, right? So that's basically cold-blooded. So now the main difference that we want to talk about between endotherms and ectotherms are like their metabolic rates, right? Because like obviously endotherms have to spend so much more energy keeping themselves warm than ectotherms. Essentially, we could talk about BMR, which is called basal metabolic rate. And we could talk about SMR, which is standard metabolic. And basically the reason why there's different things for endotherms and ectotherms is because endotherms, like, if you if you have the right temperature, their energy consumption stays relatively the same, right? Because they're always generating heat. But ectotherms, on the other hand, it depends what temperature they're at, right? Because if they're super cold, they do have to, like, generate a little bit of heat, like, by shivering, or they have to move around to get heat. So, essentially, like... SMR depends on temperature, which is why it's different from BMR. Like a single snake could have like a bunch of different SMRs based on like what temperature it is. But BMR is constant. So we already talked about how endotherms need a lot more energy, right? More energy. So your BMR is generally going to be way higher than your SMRs. However, a benefit of being an endotherm also means that you could go anywhere, right? Like, like endotherms could move around anywhere they want, even if it's cold, and they could still like move around fine. And they could still survive pretty well. But ectotherms, when it gets cold, they move really, really slowly, right? Because their metabolic rate just can't sustain movement and, like, like surviving the heat. But also ectotherms, like, because they can't regulate the temperature, they're also, like, they could survive bigger shifts in their temperature, right? Because obviously, if you can't regulate your temperature, if you die every time your temperature changes, you're just going to die immediately. Can live with different body temperatures. Alright, so then another thing that's relevant to these guys is how body size matters, right? So you would think that as your animal gets bigger, you would need more energy to sustain it, right? Well, it turns out that it's the opposite. Well, not really, but like, essentially the amount of energy you need per gram actually decreases as you get bigger. Like, for example, a mouse requires so much more energy than an elephant per gram to survive. Now, honestly, you don't have to know too much about it. Like, all you gotta know is that just smaller animals move around more, like, they they need like a lot more energy per gram and then obviously bigger animals are a bit more sluggish they don't need like as much energy per gram of body mass way more energy way more all right so now let's go back to warming stuff up and talk about how endotherms and ectotherms warm themselves up so for endotherms right like when you're cold you do not like go like out in the sun and sunbathe right to raise your temperature up right your your body automatically starts shivering it starts like doing all these things to regulate your temperature so one way they do it is something called thermogenesis, right? Like you know that your computer gets pretty hot when it has to do a lot of stuff, right? So the same thing happens in your body. When your body does a lot of stuff, it generates a lot of heat. So essentially thermogenesis is when your body generates heat by doing stuff. For example, shivering is an example of thermogenesis, right? You start moving your muscles really like really fast, right? And that warms you up because you're using more ATP. Then also there is like something called brown fat, which is basically just like it runs cellular respiration without generating any ATP. So it just keeps going, it only generates heat, brown fat, and this is basically used by hibernating animals. Now you can also change how much energy you share with the environment, right? And this is a pretty common misconception that like sweat is water and that's why it cools it down just because of the fact that it's liquid. But the actual reason why sweat actually cools you down is because the water droplets on your skin, actually the, heart, the hottest part of the water droplets evaporates, right? And then it leaves behind cooler sweat. So eventually, if you're in a hot environment, the, the evaporating sweat actually takes heat away from your body. There's also vasoconstriction slash dilation. And basically, this basically just means making your veins bigger or smaller, right? And essentially, like, heat enters and leaves your blood through your veins. 
right, or through your capillaries. So for example, in rabbit ears, you probably can see their veins in their ears, right? And essentially on a hot day, if they're if they're feeling cold and it's like hot, and then they, they could dilate the blood vessels in their ears and more heat will enter their blood and that'll warm them up. Or if they're getting too hot and the environment's really, really hot and they wanna stop like taking in heat from the environment, they can also do vasoconstriction, which means they make it smaller, which means less heat is exchanged. And then of course there is counter current heat exchange. Now this one is pretty complicated, like honestly speaking, you don't have to understand it that well, but I'll just explain it. I'll just, I'll just do my best to explain it and you guys don't worry if you don't understand it too much. But basically, let's just say you have like something that's flowing from top to bottom and something that's flowing bottom to top, right? Counter current. Let's say this part of the thing is like really hot, right? And it's getting slowly cooler. So you gotta know that like hot stuff goes to cold stuff, right? So if this part's colder, then this will start like sending heat over, right? And then it'll start sending heat over all over here. But what's cool is that this moving down actually like moves all that like like hot stuff out of the way. So this part stays cold relative to this and this keeps moving the hot stuff up. So there'll always be cold stuff to move the hot heat into on the left side. But the one thing you should understand from this is that like having this setup maximizes the amount of heat that is transferred from this fluid to this fluid. And basically animals use that like in dolphin flippers or duck feet, they basically use countercurrent exchange to either maximize how much heat they're sharing with their environment or to minimize the amount of heat that they're sharing with their environment. So ectotherms could do some of those things, but the one thing that they do that like most en endotherms do or don't do is behavioral thermogenesis. And basically all this means is that they just go on a rock and chill. <laughs> like lizards, even though they don't get like a sexy tan, <laughs> they, they still do sunbathing, okay? But basically because their metabolism can't like heat them up, they basically need the sun or like they had to move to a different places to heat themselves up, which is why it's called behavioral, right? They change their behavior in order to change the temperature. Dude, this chapter is a bunch of random stuff, I'm not gonna lie. Okay, moving on though. We are finally done with endotherms and ectotherms. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about is life history, right? So basically how animals choose to reproduce. Now this is actually kind of a complicated question, right? Like there's no clear answer on what the best way to reproduce is, right? Although most people would argue that the more the merrier, why not? <laughs> but some people would also disagree because basically there are a bunch of trade-offs to consider, right? For example, um, how many offsprings actually is a pretty big trade-off to consider because the more offspring you have, the less you could put time into each one of them. So basically some animals choose to have like a ton of offspring and just hope that some of them survive, right? Like sea urchins have millions of eggs and only like a tiny fraction of them survive, but like still enough survive that you still pass on your gene. Now if a human did that, if a human had a million babies and <laughs> hoped that some of them survived, that would be very sad. And uh, they'd probably get arrested or something. I don't even know how that would work. But you could probably see that like sea urchins, they just throw their eggs into the open, right? <laughs> Humans do not throw their babies out into the open, okay? Well, hopefully, they're not supposed to. So basically, like if you have more offspring, you care, you care for each of them less, but if you have only a few offspring, you care for them a lot more. So there's a lot more parental care. And then another one to consider is like early or later, right? If you have offspring early, right? Then you're losing out on potential time you could have been growing, right? Because reproducing takes a lot of energy, right? You're literally creating a new body inside of your own body. So if you have your offspring too early, it might be better, right? Because you have less chance to get eaten by a predator, but it's also kind of bad, right? Because like you're, you're basically crippled for the rest of your life. So basically what some animals do is they wait for later to reproduce so that they could get bigger and be more able to protect their young and then they then, then they reproduce. And then finally there is the concept of stemmal parity or iteroparity. And basically the difference between the two is basically do you reproduce once or do you reproduce many times? So basically for stemmal parity you basically reproduce once and then you die. Doesn't seem that fun. <laughs> but basically a bunch of like flies, a bunch of like tapeworms and that kind of stuff, they basically produce a ton of offspring once they just go one big boom and then they all die. Other animals like mammals, for example, they basically go through a bunch of cycles, right? Menstrual cycles, estrus cycles. They basically go through these cycles and each time they produce offspring. And it kind of makes sense, right? Semel means like one time, right? Same one, one, one time. And then itero means you're doing it iteratively, right? You just keep going one, two, three, four, five, you keep going. So speaking of reproduction, why don't we talk about how like populations grow, let's just say. So basically, there are two types of main growth for populations, right? There's exponential and there is logistic. So exponential kind of makes sense, right? If each person is having offspring, right? The more people you have, the more offspring you're going to have, right? So essentially, the more people you have, the faster you grow, which is why, like, if you have, you start off slow and then as you get more people, it just keeps going up, right? That's exponential. Now, the, the formal way to write this is like dn over dt is equal to rn. Not only does it look like fancy random calculus, but it's actually pretty self-explanatory, okay? just the change in population size 
is proportional to the population size, right? The more population you get, the more offspring are being produced. And that's why it's like goes up really, really steep because you keep getting more and more steep. And this makes sense, right? If you have no like restrictions on how much you grow, right? Like obviously this makes sense. But that's not true, right? Like, obviously, I can't just grow as big as this room and fill it all. I mean, I probably can't just because I can't. But, like, if, if I were to keep growing, okay, then eventually I'd hit the roof. And that would prevent me from growing, right? In the same way, populations hit a so-called roof called the carrying capacity, right? So, essentially, every ecosystem only has so many resources, right? So, like, only so many people could survive off those so many resources. So, instead of going like this and going in really, really steep, it actually kind of looks something like this, where it's like a S shape. Logistic has an S in it, that is why it looks like an S. Makes very much sense. <laughs> but basically the reason for this is as there becomes less resources, less people could actually have offspring. And this is basically whenever a ecosystem could only support so many people of a population. Now the mathy way to put it is dn over dt is equal to like um, n times k minus n over k, which kind of makes sense, right? When n equals k, this is zero, which means that you're stopped growing, and when you're at zero people, how do you have offspring with zero people, right? So that also stops growing, which is why it's like flat here. And then eventually it maxed out here and it goes like that. So, so this makes sense. And then there's like some constant before it, a. But that doesn't really matter, okay? Just remember that logistic is an S-shaped curve when you have stuff like stopping them from reproducing, and exponential is just this massive like upward thing just because there's no limits on it. Like you can kind of see it, right? The beginning of logistic actually looks like exponential, right? Because when you're far away from carrying capacity, it doesn't really affect you. All right, so let's talk about the factors that cause this logistic growth nonsense. They're basically divided up into things called density dependent and density independent factors. Now density dependent means exactly what it seems like it means. What do you guys think it means? Density dependent. It depends on density. Holy moly, that is crazy. Well, basically to give you guys some concrete examples, right? As you get more and more people like in a certain place, more of them are going to compete against each other, right? So competition is an example of a density dependent factor. Also, if you get more crowded people, disease is more likely to spread, right? And that's going to limit your population because like obviously people are more likely to die out if you're more dense. There's a lot more examples, but you guys pretty basically get the idea, right? Like if the damage something does is dependent on how many people there are, then it is density dependent. But if it doesn't depend on how many people there are, then it's density independent, right? Like a flood or a like fire, right? These guys don't even care how many people there are, right? They'll just kill whoever's in the way. So for this one, for density independent, basically all the examples are natural disasters, right? So if it asks, is this thing a density independent or density dependent? If it's a natural disaster, go to the right. If it's not, just go to the left, okay? Don't think about it too much. Well, you probably should think about it a little bit, but in most cases, it's going to be left if it's not a natural disaster. Okay, nice. And now, there is one more thing that we didn't talk about. We talked about logistic, we talked about exponential, but things could actually go up and down and up and down, right? They're not just like these flat lines. Like say for example, if we had a like predator, right? Like let's say the lynx and we had a prey, they're like hair or something. So let's say the lynx is red, it goes up and down. You guys gotta admit that is beautiful. And then let's say the hair is blue. So basically let's think about this, right? When there's not many lynxes, right? the, the um, population of the rabbits is going to go up, right? But then, as there's so many rabbits and so few lynxes, the lynxes are going to increase in population, right? Because there's so many rabbits and not that many lynxes to compete against each other. Well, usually the rabbits are way above because there's way more prey than predator. And then, once there becomes so many lynxes, then the rabbits start going down, right? Because there's so many predators. So eventually it'll start going down. But then eventually, the hares will start being too little to support all these lynxes, right? And then the lynxes will go down, right? So essentially, these guys keep like going up and down together, right? Well, I mean, technically, if I drew this more carefully, it'd be something like this, something like that. But yeah, basically you see, right, like, if there's a ton of lynxes, it'll cause the hairs to go down, but as the hairs go down, then the lynxes go down too. And then it keeps going up and down with each other. So that's just something to keep in mind, that not everything is exponential or logistic. Okay, we're almost done with population stuff, okay? So... The next thing we gotta talk about are food webs. Okay, we should probably use black. All right, so you guys probably know that all food webs start at the very bottom, right? With people who can produce their own food. And those guys are called autotrophs or producers, right? Like obviously they're producing the food, come on. What else are you gonna call them? And auto means like themselves, right? They're producing their own food, so that's why it's an autotroph. So examples of these are plants, right? You don't see plants going around eating anyone unless they're a Venus flytrap. And these guys are called photoautotrophs, right? Because they basically turn sunlight into sugars and then the animals can eat the plants to get those sugars. Then there are also chemoautotrophs, and these guys are less common. You guys probably don't see them very often, but basically these guys are the ones that use chemical compounds. And the reason why you don't see them is because they're found very deep underwater in those like hydrothermal vents. And they basically use the heat of the hydrothermal vents along with like, like 
um, chemical compounds to make sugar. And basically these autotrophs are eaten by heterotrophs, right? Like hetero means different, right? So they're getting their food from a different animal. And they're called consumers because they consume stuff. Holy moly, this is crazy. And these could be anything, right? Like a rabbit is a consumer. A fox is also a consumer, even though it doesn't directly eat the plants. It eats the rabbit, but it's still called a consumer. So essentially, we could draw this from top to bottom or left to right. Well, top to bottom probably makes more sense. So essentially, you have your, um, like, I don't know, grass which is eaten by the rabbit, which is eaten by the fox, which perhaps is eaten by a bear, who knows? <laughs> Probably not, but let's, let's say that for, for argument's sake, okay? So essentially, these guys are the producers, right? Primary producer. This guy is the primary consumer, right? Because it's the first consumer in the chain. Basically, a chain is when you have one to one to one to one. Food web is when you have a bunch of chains combined in all random ways, but this is just one chain. Primary consumer. Then a fox, guess what it is? If, if the rabbit is primary, what do you think the fox is? That's right, it's secondary consumer. And finally, we have tertiary consumers, or if they are not eaten by anyone, they're called apex predators. Now, each of these levels is called a trophic level, okay? So, I don't know how to remember that well, but basically, all these things are called trophic levels. Primary producers, a trophic level, right? All the primary producers combined make one trophic level, then you go up one, you get to the primary consumers, then you go up one, you get to the secondary consumers, and then you go up one and you get to the tertiary consumers. Now, the reason why this is relevant is because all the energy starts from here, and it has to go through each of the trophic levels to eventually reach the top trophic level, right? And as you gotta know, nature is pretty inefficient, okay? Like, maybe not as inefficient as your dad's, like, 2001, like, Honda Odyssey. <laughs> Bro, that's literally what I have to drive to school every day. It's kind of embarrassing. But it's still pretty inefficient. So, so if there's, like, a ton of energy in the grass, only 10% of that energy in the grass is actually converted to the rabbit's energy, right? So while these rabbits are spoiled on, like, heaps of grass, the foxes only have 10% of the energy to have their fun on. And then, the foxes only gain 1% of the 10% of the energy of the grass. So overall, they only get 1% of the original energy. Because like, every trophic level, only 10% goes up, right? So 10% of 10% is only 1%. So basically, even the foxes are kind of spoiled, okay? The bears are the ones who actually are living it tough. And they only get 0.1% of the energy of the grass. So you can probably see, right, why there's so much grass. There's a lot of rabbits, not quite as much rabbits as there is grass. And then there's even less foxes, and then there are very, very, very few bears, right? Because essentially there's very, very little energy available to those bears. And then of course, like, outside of these food chains are things that, like, when, when any of these guys die, right? There basically has to be somebody who decomposes them, right? And they get all the energy of the universe, they just get whatever dies, so they don't, they, they're, they're pretty spoiled too. And these guys are like fungi and bacteria and stuff. Now, a very fun fact that a lot of people miss up. Decomposer means that they actually secrete chemicals that break down molecules into their very, very, like, basic form, right? But there are things called detritivores, like vultures and stuff. They eat dead stuff too, right? But they don't actually like break it down to those individual molecules like the fungi and bacteria do, right? Fungi and bacteria secrete these chemicals and break them down in the environment. Vultures actually ingest it and then break it down. So that's the main difference. The tritivores ingest it, decomposers actually break it down in the environment. So why don't we actually like think about a very fun like thought experiment because I like sounding like Einstein even though I'm not. So we start with our P1s, our primary producers, then we go to our primary consumer, C1, and then we go to C3, or C2. <laughs> 1 to 3, very epic, C3, okay. So let us think, what happens if we increase the number of P1s, right? Well, if there's more grass, right, there are going to be more rabbits, because the rabbits have more grass to eat, then if there's more rabbits to eat, then there's more foxes, and then if there's more foxes to eat, then there's more bears, right? So essentially, all of these guys go up. If this guy goes up, then all of these guys also go up. And then obviously, if we decrease the amount of grass, there's going to be less rabbits, there's going to be less foxes, and there's going to be less bears. But what happens if we, for example, decrease the number of bears? Then, there's less bears to eat the foxes, right? So that's probably going to go up. Then if there's more foxes to eat the rabbits, then there's probably going to be less rabbits. And if there's less rabbits to eat the grass, then there's going to be more grass. So it's kind of cool, right? If you go from the bottom up, it actually increases everything. But if you decrease the number of predators, it actually alternates. It goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up. So whenever you're doing these kind of problems, I'm pretty sure they will ask this kind of thing on the test, but essentially the idea is when something goes down, the thing under it will go up, but if something goes up, then the thing above it will also go up. And it just makes sense logically, right? If you have more things to eat something, the thing that's getting eaten will go down. If you have less thing to eat something, the thing that is getting eaten will go up. Okay, Epic, we are almost done. We are finally on communities, okay? And remember, communities are when you have a bunch of populations of the same species 
interacting with other species. So, because there's a bunch of species interacting, we gotta talk about interspecific interactions, which means between species interactions, which is basically what I've been saying this whole time. And basically, in these interactions, there's two species involved, right? And essentially, either one of them could benefit or not benefit. So essentially, to represent these interactions, we just use a plus slash plus, or like, plus slash minus. Bro, I can speak. <laughs> But basically, like, what, like, this means that one benefits, one, like, uh, is harmed. This means both benefit, like, obviously minus minus would mean both, like, are get harmed by the interaction, and so on and so forth. So, why don't we get started with all of the interactions? Alright, first, you got competition. And that basically means two species are trying to do something, or, like, sharing a certain resource, and they both need to, like, or both are trying their best to get it. And this, if you think about it, is minus minus, right? Like, both species, like, would do better if there was not another species to compete against it. Then there's predation, right? Like, obviously, for this one, like, one of them's benefiting, right? One of them gets a very epic, like, five-star meal, and the other one gets dead. <laughs> so it's quite clearly a minus. Okay. Then there's, like, a whole other category called symbiosis, and that basically is when there's a really close relationship. And this could fall under three categories that you probably know already. Mutualism. And mutualism makes sense, right? Mutual means it's both ways, so mutualism means that both of them benefit. Commensalism is a whack one that you probably will not remember compared to the other two because mutualism is pretty obvious. Commensalism is just plus slash zero, right? One of them benefits, the other one is not harmed. And then there's parasitism, which you guys probably already know. Like, obviously one thing is benefiting by riding on a host and then the host is losing out. So it is plus slash minus. All right, nice. So basically these ones are pretty straightforward, right? Like mutualism is when clownfish and anem anemone, right? Like both the anemone and clownfish benefit from their interaction. Commensalism, like they're not that many uh, inter like interaction that are commensalism because like usually they're gonna have some impact on each other. Then parasitism, there's a lot of impact, like a lot of examples, right? Like um, like any tapeworm in a human is like parasitism, right? Because it causes disorders in the humans, but the tapeworms actually get to reproduce. Wow, what a, what a good deal. But the more fun one is competition. So let us talk about competition. So then the competition is just species like competing for resources, right? And essentially each like each species has something called a niche and that basically talks about which resources those are describes resources used by organism now basically why this is relevant to competition is because if niches overlap right if multiple organisms are using the same resource then there's going to be more competition between them more overlap equals more competition like if you and your friend both have the same hobbies right you guys are going to be fighting against each other to be better at one of the uh, at all of those hobbies all the time right but when it comes to species it's a little bit more cutthroat than that <laughs> Because it turns out that there's something called the competitive exclusion principle, which is pretty descriptive actually. And it basically says that no two animals can have the same niche, right? Because if two species are have the exact same niche, one of them is just going to be slightly better, right? So eventually the one that's slightly better will like get like keep growing and the one that's slightly worse will keep getting less, right? And eventually either that smaller species will have to change its niche or it will just die out completely. So niches are exclusive, right? Exclusion due to Competition, competitive, very nice. All right, so this concept of niches and how like all these species have different like roles plays into the concept of biodiversity, okay? And this one's a pretty important one. You don't really have to know that much about it cause like the word is literally biodiversity, right? Diversity of bio. But the concept is that it's not only the number of organisms, right? Like you might have a ton of organisms, but if they're all the same species, are you really that diverse? So essentially biodiversity matters on two things, right? Species richness, and relative abundance. So obviously, you need a lot of species to be biodiverse, right? But also, you don't want all of those animals to be one species, and they're just like one dude of the other of the other species, right? So that's why relative abundance is also important, because you want all the species to be relatively evenly represented. So if we look at an example, right? Let's just say there's three species, A, B, and C, and then in environment one and environment two, there are 10, 10, and 10. But in this other environment, there are like 18, 1, 1, right? Now, clearly, it seems logical that one has more biodiversity, right? Because they have the same species richness, right? They both have three species, but this guy has better relative abundance, right? They're both, they're all equally, approximately equally the same. <laughs> Dang, approximately equally the same. I'm too good at this game. <laughs> Bruh. But yeah, you guys get the idea. Probably isn't too much else to say about biodiversity though, so let us move on. Okay, so I just want to throw in two more things about species, right? Um, there's two main types of species in these environments, right? So there's basically a foundation species. So there's basically a foundation species. And these are the, basically the ones that the entire environment is built off of, right? So like corals, for example, they make up the entire backbone of coral reefs, right? 
And then for like forest, I'm assuming trees would also be a uh, foundation species, all that kind of stuff. Then there are also keystone species, and these guys are basically the ones that, even if there are a very few of them, they actually have a very disproportionate impact on their environment. So for example, the beaver. The beaver is my favorite animal now. But the reason why beavers are a keystone species, right, is because they're very few, like even one beaver, right? And they can make a dam and completely change the entire like ecosystem, right? Because a river is very different from a lake. And if you add a dam, you're changing a river to a lake. So just remember, foundation are basically species that there are a lot of and they basically build up the entire environment. And then keystone basically means that even though there are very few of them, they have a very, very big impact on the on the entire ecosystem. Okay, and now finally we are on to the last topic, which is human intervention. So how have humans been changing the ecology of their like ecosystems, right? So one way they've done that is through invasive species. And invasive species are pretty self-explanatory, right? Like a human brings one animal from one place to another. And these species are often way able to like colonize the entire thing because they are they they didn't evolve there, right? So essentially they might have an unfair advantage over all of the inhabitants that are already there. Like a pretty good example is like the brown tree snake that was introduced to Guam or something. And basically the birds there never had any predators. And when you had a snake there, they don't have any defenses. So the snake basically killed off all the birds. And this usually happens because those species don't actually have like natural predators in the new location, right? So they not only have nothing to control them, but they also have an easier time catching prey because their prey is not adapted to avoid them. Then of course humans use a lot of resources, right? So of course there's renewable and non-renewable resources, right? And we tend to use the non-renewable type, right? We use fossil fuels and all that stuff. And basically that's releasing a ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And then you guys probably know that when we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that causes global warming and climate change. Because essentially carbon dioxide traps in a lot of the heat. So that eventually leads to increased temperature. And essentially the idea is that climate change has actually shifted a lot of the ecosystems, right? Like you, we've been pushing up like the Arctic Circle. We've been pushing down Antarctica. We've been like endangering a bunch of the animals that depend on like on these polar ice caps and that kind of thing. So in that way, climate change has been disrupting a ton of ecosystems. And then of course there are extinctions, right? So essentially when an animal species disappears completely, the no left living individuals of that species, it goes extinct. And basically it's said that we've been causing the sixth mass extinction. Because essentially we've disrupted so many environments that like a, like a way higher amount of species have been going extinct recently because of human intervention. So just remember that extinct means that they're completely gone, endangered means they're about to be gone. And basically as these species go extinct, we're reducing biodiversity, which has a very bad like consequence on like ecosystem because essentially biodiverse ecosystems are actually more productive than not biodiverse ecosystems. All right, very nice. So now we are finally done with the entire unit. Um, there's a lot more stuff in the book, but it turns out that it's not very covered on the AP exam. So Everything in this video should have been the main stuff covered in the AP exam. If you guys have any questions, let me know down in the comments below. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. Thank you guys for watching again, and see you guys next time.